Whenever there's an earthquake anywhere in the world, it means something's happening deep beneath the Earth's surface. Ciao ragazzi, this video was written and filmed in Italian by our team of scientists, storytellers and video makers, manually translated into English, but, but, dubbed with artificial intelligence. Long live culture and let's go back to the video. To help you understand the key concepts behind earthquakes, I've decided to do a deep dive into faults, into the world of faults. So what's the relationship between faults and earthquakes? Stress builds up along a fault and grows and grows and grows until suddenly the fault moves and boom, it releases energy. This energy spreads in waves that obviously also reach the surface, making everything shake, making everything vibrate. E quindi succede questo. Faults are fractures in the Earth's crust, but if I stop there, the definition wouldn't be complete. In fact, a fault isn't just a fracture that splits one block of rock into two blocks. A fault is a fracture, in combination with the relative movement of one of the two blocks. Let me show you what I mean by using a piece of styrofoam. Actually, it's called polystyrene. If I break it, I create a fracture. If I take the fracture and make one of the two blocks move down, up, right, left, in any direction I like, I'm creating a fault. The most accurate definition of a fault is a crack in the Earth's crust that is accompanied by the movement of one of the two sides along the plane of fracture, which is aptly called the fault plane. But let's go and see it. I want to show you a picture, like the kind you'd study in high school or university, so we can fix the image in our minds. Every fault, we said, has a fault plane which is precisely the plane along which the rock split into two distinct blocks. One of the two blocks, what we call the foot wall, is considered stationary. In geology, the foot wall is taken as stationary. The block that moves, on the other hand, is called the hanging wall, and in a minute we'll look at the ways in which it can move. The fault plane is obviously going to be inclined at a certain angle. The inclination usually ranges from about 30 degrees from the horizontal to about 60, 70 or even 80 degrees. Another thing to note is that, since it's a linear structure, something that's straight in space, or perhaps sublinear, the fault will also have a direction relative to the north, its strike, and it will also have what's called a dip. That is, which way the fault plane slopes downwards, whether it's this way or the other. These two things, strike and dip, are, in reality, data for mapping a fault. That is, putting a fault on a map. So if I go do my survey, and then another geologist or technician has to read my data, obviously, they've got to know how to interpret it. That's why I have to include a fault strike and dip, meaning how it's oriented in space. At this point, the question naturally arises. How and why does movement occur along a fault? The movement can be in all directions, and what happens depends mainly on what we call the tectonic setting. You know that tectonic plates move, and between two plates, to put it very simply, three things can essentially happen. They can collide, they can move apart, and they can grind past each other. As you can probably guess, for each of these three scenarios, there's a different kind of fault. So. There are three types of faults. Obviously, in nature, things are more complex, as you can imagine. But right now, we're just trying to understand the basics. So I think it's okay if we keep it simple. The first type of fault is a reverse fault. When there's a collisional tectonic setting, therefore a compressional one, we get what are known as reverse faults. In reverse faults, the hanging wall, one of the two blocks, moves upwards. Reverse faults produce elevations. Can you see that it's going up? A mountain's being made. Mountains are created by reverse faults and therefore by tectonic compression. In English, they're also referred to as thrust faults. The second type of fault is what's known as a normal or gravity fault. In this case, the hanging wall moves downward relative to the foot wall. This second type of fault is typical not of compressive tectonic settings, but of extensional divergent ones. And if reverse faults give rise to mountains, normal faults do the opposite, meaning they create depressions and basins. So reverse faults create elevations, while extensional faults create depressions. Then there are, and this is the third type, strike-slip faults. 
Where the hanging wall movement isn't up or down anymore, you know, not like this or like that, but rather a lateral movement. The walls scrape past each other. This means that if I have a pure strike slip fault, that is, one with no upward or downward movement, only lateral, then neither elevations nor depressions will result. The thing is, though, that nature, well, nature is incredibly complex. And I can tell you from experience that faults are rarely just normal and therefore extensional or just reverse. There's almost invariably a lateral component. That is, there's almost always a bit of a sideways movement going on. So focus now and try to bear with me. If we have a reverse fault in which there's also a degree of strike slip, meaning a bit of sideways movement, we get what's known as a transpressional fault. Guys, this is advanced stuff. I'm telling you, really advanced. The term transpressional is derived from trans, meaning a bit of sideways movement, and pressional, which comes from compressional, okay? On the other hand, we talk about a fault being transtensional if there's a sideways component combined with an extensional component. What we're looking at is up there with first year university structural geology. Many of the geological reconstructions we have, I'm talking about the reconstructions that show us Earth's geological timeline, were made possible by studying faults and the evolution of faults over time. Faults, once they first form, then reactivate countless times over the years. Because once you've got a break, once that break exists, well, if a force is applied, it will tend to be released, so to speak, along the existing break. It's much easier to exploit an existing crack than to make a new one. Here comes something interesting about earthquakes. Every fault moving again and again over a geological time scale, of course, can produce countless earthquakes, whose magnitudes obviously vary. Keep in mind that with each movement, you know, a step forms, as we observed earlier, which can range from a few centimeters to a few meters in height. When a fault scarp is formed, that's what the step is actually called, a fault scarp. Well, if it's several meters high, it means the earthquake was a really, really powerful one. And how big can the steps along the, the faults be? There are faults with quote-unquote steps that are over a kilometer high. So, for these huge steps to have formed, it means that the faults have been reactivated countless times. I know some of you will be asking yourselves, but can a fault over its geological life change from being a normal fault to a reverse fault? Yes, and in that case, it's known as tectonic inversion. Tectonic forces, as we know, change over a geological time span. So if a normal fault that originally formed in an extensional setting finds itself in a compressional setting, it will become a reverse fault, tectonic inversion. In nature, it's much rarer to find a reverse fault that turns into a normal fault. And now let's head to the surface. These faults that start several kilometers down below in the subsurface 2, 3, 10, 20, 30, 40, maybe 100 kilometers deep. What do I see up on the surface? From the surface, can I tell if there's a fault deep down below? If the fault plane, that is the break, spreads all the way up to the surface, then yes, I'll see a fault scarp right on the surface too. So I can actually put my hands on the fault plane. Now, as we're not out there in the field, I can't let you touch a fault plane or see what one's like, but I can show you something on a map. One of the most amazing things that you learn when you study geological sciences is how to view the landscape in a whole new light. Nobody, and I mean nobody at all, can observe a landscape quite the way a geologist can. I'll cut straight to the chase. If I go on Google Earth in satellite view and take a little tour, perhaps around Croatia, for example, I'm bound to spot structures that stretch for kilometers, tens of kilometers, heck, even hundreds or thousands of kilometers. They're sublinear meaning that they're almost straight, so straight, or curving in a gentle arc. These sublinear forms are the surface evidence of the faults running below. Try and picture it as a knife slicing through the rocks, from down below, from the depths, towards the top, towards the surface. Sometimes the cut goes all the way to the surface and then I can see it. Sometimes it doesn't quite reach the surface, but it comes close. And in that case, very often what I see on the surface isn't a fault line, so not a cut, but rather a fold, a bump. It's not by chance that mountain chains are also called fold and thrust belts. But this doesn't mean that I can always see evidence on the surface when there's a fault at depth below. In fact, there are ancient faults, ones that were perhaps last active millions of years ago, that have quite literally been buried under what can be even several kilometers of sediment 
that is to say, other rock. So they're buried and I can't see anything up top. Maybe it's completely flat and I can't see anything below, like with the Po Valley, for example. The Po Valley. It's a plain. But how many of you know that there's a mountain range under the Po Valley? Well, check this out. This little layer up here is the Po Valley Plain. Underneath, there are these thrusts and folds. So in this case, how can I find out what's down there? The only way to do that is by using a method like reflection seismology. Reflection seismology is the only method we have to date, the only technology currently available that can provide us with a sort of scan of the first 5 to 10 kilometers of the subsurface with a good level of detail. Check out how cool this is. This is the seismic cross-section, and the one below it is its interpretation. That is here, a geologist has interpreted the information that's up here. All the red parts are false. I mean, look what's going on down in the subsurface. Under a mountain range, there's something like that. All right, all those folds and faults. And that's exactly what I wanted to get to today, to these images, to seismic reflection. These images that you're looking at were a big part of the work I did before Geopop. When I worked abroad for about 10 years, I studied the subsurface of, I think, over 80 to 90 basins around the world, on all continents, offshore, pretty much everywhere. And one thing I'll never forget is that in 2016, I spent the whole year in Bolivia reconstructing the geological history of the Bolivian Andes. You know, back then, I actually used to dream about faults. I dream about faults moving. I mean, when you're that deeply involved in something, it can be just crazy. A really cool thing, though, is that the structural model they use in Bolivia today is the one I created. And that, guys, that's structural geology for you. It's not a very well-known field, but it's a pretty amazing one. It's wonderful because the subsurface is amazing and wonderful. We don't see the subsurface. Usually, we don't know what's down there. But when you do see it, it makes you want to ask, how is that even possible? In fact, I want to show you some seismic cross-sections from all around the world, at least the ones I have available. Here's a seismic cross-section of the Adriatic. At depth, you can see that there are these falls. This is a seismic cross-section of the North Sea. What are those? These are all, let's say, strata, okay? And these sub-vertical ones, which I can highlight like this, are my faults. So if I highlight this stratum in green and continue taking these faults into consideration, I end up with steps the steps we talked about before. Can you see that? Between one step and the next, obviously, there are faults. So, for instance, right here, I'll add another fault. See? It goes all the way down, and then we lose sight of it at some point. Here, it's the same thing. Where is the fault in this one? It goes up to about here, more or less. It does this. Can you see that? Right here, there's this little step. Look how big the step is at depth and how big it is at the surface. It changes. There's not much on the surface. So here it does something like this. Okay, here it goes like this, and then here we lose it. The faults are usually marked in red. Fantastic. Guys, when I'm in my element, it gives me a real thrill. That said, I want to thank you for sticking with me till the end. I'll catch you for the next video right here on Geopop Everyday Science.